Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Judges. Once again, the book of Judges, chapter 10 and uh, 11 today. Mostly we're going to just focus on several passages here this morning, but Judges chapter 10 and 11. Today I want to talk to you about the danger of presumption. Uh, there's a lot of times in our life where we just sort of presume uh, the things are going to go the way we think they are. Every once in a while, you'll see a, a, a sports team that'll come in and, you know, they're going to play somebody that they think they should beat. You know, here you got this 9-0 and team going to go on, you know, fight this 0-9 team. I remember when I was in high school, um, uh, I forget what year it was we were in there. Uh, St. Clairsville, Ohio, had an incredible football team that year. Uh, they had a kid on that team named Tim Spencer. You may remember Spencer. He played uh, for the San Diego Chargers for a while later on. He was an incredible running back. And they were, they were coming in uh, to play our high school that year. They were 9-0. and uh, they had only been scored upon like two times that entire season. Nobody thought my, our high school was 0 and 9. We, we, we were terrible. Um, uh, we had hardly scored a point that season. They had hardly given up a point. Everybody in the Ohio Valley assumed uh, uh, St. Clairsville is going to come in there, roll over Jefferson Union High School. It will be no problem at all, and uh, they will go on to play in the uh, state playoffs. Now, back in those days, I need to explain something to you. Ohio worked on a thing where you had to win your conference championship in order to go to the playoffs. And so in order to do that, in order to win their conference championship, St. Clairsville had to beat JU. They, go, they could literally go 9-1 and one and not make the state playoffs. They had to beat us. It was an absolute game. But it was presumed everybody knew that they were going to win, except Ken Newland. Ken Newland was the football coach, head football coach for Jefferson Union that year, and uh, he had, came up with a novel plan. He said, you know, we don't have to beat these fellas. All we got to do is tie them. We're going to keep them out of the state playoffs. They had mocked our team in the, in the papers. They had, their coach had assumed he was already talking about the state playoffs before on the week when they were interviewed about the game. He was already talking about the state playoffs. He was just completely, he presumed he would win. What he didn't know was our head coach took that team out and they practiced on our field, our varsity field, every day that week. They took the VOAG, the greatest uh, 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 department in our high school was the vocation agricultural group. They took out and drove tractors on the field. It was raining all week, by the way. And that field, when they went out to play on it, had about four inches of mud on it. Neither team ever moved the ball past either us 40-yard line. It ended in a 0-0 tie. St. Clairsville didn't get to go to the state playoffs. And forever, every Yellow Jacket tells that story. <laughs> Why do I tell? They presumed they'd win. They assumed it would be easy. Presumption, uh, according to the dictionary, is to suppose that something is the case on the base of pro basis of probability. In other words, we look at things and we say, well, past history says this, and we just presume the future is going to be the same. A few years ago, we had a great stock market crash. There were a lot of people in those days who presumed that, that stocks would continue to go up and up and up. I remember in the big real estate bubble that happened, I had a friend of mine uh, who was heavily in debt. He had bought properties all over the state of Virginia, and, and he had made a great deal of money. And he remembers him telling me one time, he's trying to get me to invest in it. And he said, you know, he says, Joe, the real estate market will always go up. It's the safest, it's the safest investment in America. <laughs> well, we found out it wasn't the safest. He presumed he knew what the future held and it came back to bite him. We can see that in the later part of the book of Judges, the nation of Israel began to presume that God would continue to deliver them in the same way that he had had throughout the earlier chapters. As we went through this book, you know, we've seen that kind of common pattern that's in this book. What, what ends up happening is Israel falls into sin. Uh, God sends a, a judgment against them to get them to wake up, to realize he'll send a, a foreign nation in. They will oppress God's people for a period of time, which will bring about a, a sense of despair and result in repentance. God's people say, hey, God, we're sorry, deliver us, and then God delivers them. 
That's been the pattern in every story in the book of Judges, and everyone in Israel assumed that's the way it will always be. That's the way this whole system works. And so here in Judges chapter 10, things start out pretty much the same. Let's, let's just read uh, here uh, uh, the first uh, uh, nine verses or so. Um, and it says, After Abimelech there arose to save Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo. How would you like to be named Dodo? I, I love the names in the Bible. If I ever had twins, I used to tell Grace, there's a set of twins named Huzz and Buzz in the Bible. If we ever had twins, we were going to name them Huzz and Buzz. Here's, here's a guy named Dodo, a son of a man of Issachar, and he lived uh, at Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim, and he judged Israel 23 years, and he died and was buried at Shamir. And after him arose Jer, the Gilead, Gileadite, uh, who judged Israel 22 years, and he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and he had 30 cities like Havoth Jair, and to this day, which are in the land of Gilead, and Jair died and was buried at Kerem. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, verse 6, and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. I want to stop there and point out something here. Most of the time in this book, they would fall for, you know, one of the other foreign gods. If they were having a drought or, or a time where their crops were failing, they would, they would, you know, sort of chase after Baal or, or they would chase after Ashtoreth. I want to show you how bad things have gotten. Israel has gotten so presumptuous. Now, they're worshiping all of the false gods. It's not just one or two. What's happened here is, is it shows us sort of a, a pattern that happens in our lives. Uh, the old saying is, you know, sin will take you further than you intended to go. What, what ends up happening is sin just sort of multiplies in our life, and that's particularly true of the sin of idolatry. Once we start worshiping one false god, we will start worshiping numerous false gods. And again, I've said it to, throughout this series. We tend as Americans to think we're immune to that. We don't have a problem of idolatry. We may be one of the most idolatrous cultures that's ever lived. The reality is you don't have to bow down to a statue of a foreign god. Materialism can be an idol. Family can be an idol. Anything that you look to find and meet your needs ahead of God, anything that you give your devotion to ahead of the Lord, that is an idol. And so here, they've got a whole list of false gods that they've begun to worship. And notice what happens. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the Ammonites. And they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. Same situation that we've encountered time and time and time again throughout this book. And this is constantly reminding us that we always have this battle going on in our lives. There's always this, this battle in the, in the life of the believer that wants to pull us away from the things of God, to get us to, to give our allegiance, to give our devotion to other things. We've constantly got to battle with this issue. And so what ends up happening is the people end up presuming they know how this is going to work. They've been down this road before. Uh, we sin. God sends an oppressor, we're going to call out, God's going to forgive, everything's going to be fine. But the Bible warns us strongly against the problem of presumption. Now, let me give you two other biblical examples besides what we're going to look at today. In Numbers 14, the children of Israel came back and they heard and were frightened by a report from the spies who were sent into the promised land. You remember that? And they decided we won't enter in uh, to the land. And so God uh, announces through Moses that he's going to judge the people for their disobedience. Then they decided to go, they, they, then God, uh, uh, they, they repented and God forgave them. But then they presumed 
The moment they received God's forgiveness, they presumed, let's just march right into the land and let's have a battle. God must be with us now. Let's go in. And they just presumed, without getting any further instructions from God, without hearing him at all, the children of Israel the number, marched right in. And you know what happened? They got their tails whipped. They presumed they knew what God was going to do. Same thing in 1 Samuel 15. But Saul presumed to know what God would want and spares the life of Agag. He says, man, you know, Agag's a great king. He's got lots of riches. God would surely want me to save his life. God would surely want me to take all of his material possessions. And you know what happens? God rejected him as a king. Every time we presume, we get ourselves in trouble. And so this morning, I want to show you three ways that people fall into the sin of presumption from this passage. First of all, we presume on God's grace without repentance. This is what a lot of American Christianity, frankly, is built upon. That that, that we just presume that God is going to give us grace and no repentance is required. Uh, let me show you where we find that in this text. In verse, in verse 10, look what happens in, in, here in, in, uh, in, in the Scriptures. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We've sinned against you because we've forsaken our God and have served the Baals. Okay? They cry out, Hey, God, we deserve this. We, we, you know, uh, uh, we've sinned against you. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and the Ammonites and the Philistines, the Sidonians also, and the Amalekites and the Maronites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, and I saved you out of their hand, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Now notice what he says. This may be one of the most frightening verses in all of the book of Judges. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods of whom you've chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. Let me show you what's been happening. God sits there in verses 11 and 12, and he reminds them of his past deliverance. He goes back and he says, this is what's happened in the past. But then in verse 13, he reminds them that in spite of everything that they've seen from God, all the ways that God has worked in their past, they still turn and and serve false gods. And so therefore, God says, uh, I'm not going to do it this time. Uh, I kind of put him in the voice of Jerry Clower when he says that. I ain't going to do it. I'm not going to do it this time. You've sinned against me. You have not learned the lesson. But I want to point out something. One of the things that's happened is God recognizes there's an insincerity here in Israel's request. But what was happening was they were going through the most. They said the words, hey, God, we're sorry. But their actions have demonstrated that they've been insincere. This is an example of what the Bible calls worldly grief. Over in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, 10, the Bible says, For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. In this particular case, this is a great example of the difference. He says there's two ways when we come before God that we can grieve over sin. One is a worldly way of doing that. And what he means by that is that's the kind of grief that we have when we're only sad because we got caught. (laughs) We're only sad because we got caught. Uh, it's going to create a disruption in our life. All of a sudden, you know, things are going to get challenging for us. And so really, it's just a, a self-centered sort of grief. All of a sudden, my sin is creating an inconvenience for me. It's creating a difficult for me. But I'm really not repenting because godly grief leads to repentance. Godly grief understands this, that our, the problem with our sin is primarily not what it does to us, but who we've sinned against. We like to talk about the consequences of our sin. It created this problem in my life. It hurt me in this way. But that's not the biggest problem of sin. Let me tell you what the biggest problem of sin is. It's not what it did to you. It's what happens between you and God as a result of your sin. You are created 
Listen to me. You are fearfully and wonderfully and specially made by God. Your greatest purpose in life is to have a relationship with him. And when sin comes in and violates that, what's happened is you have have sinned against God who made you to have a relationship with him. Ultimately, what it's done is we've sinned against the holiness of God. And so what happens in worldly grief, I'm just saying, God, can you get me out of this mess? I didn't study for the test, God, but please help me to pass it. There's worldly grief. Lord, please let that test result. I know I've not done this right. I know that I've sinned, but Lord, please let this happen even though I haven't deserved it. Repentance says, God, I've sinned against you. I've chased after a false God. I've chased after something that could never possibly bring satisfaction in my life. I have put something in the place of my life where only you belong. You see what I'm saying? They've come out, and and they're not really repenting. They just want to avoid the consequences of their sin. American churches, uh, honestly, have largely neglected the role of repentance in our salvation. In fact, for a long time, you'd be hard-pressed to hear the word repent in an evangelical church. I remember reading a book a number of years ago uh, where a guy was saying, and he was writing about evangelism. He was talking to people about how to share the gospel. And by the way, this was a Southern Baptist writer. He's a well-known writer. If I said his name, many of you would recognize it. And here's what he said. Don't talk about repentance because that's a negative He approached the gospel like we were selling a car. Don't point out the bump on the on the side. Don't point, you know, don't point out the gas mileage. Uh, Don't point out this because it might be a negative. He was saying, listen, don't talk about repentance because people want to hear that. That's negative. Guys, listen to me. Without repentance, there is no salvation. Without repentance, there. listen, you can say you believe in Jesus all day, but if you don't turn from your sin, you're not saved because the Bible says repent and believe. It doesn't say pray a prayer. It doesn't say say magic words. It says repent and believe. And so step one in that is repent. They wanted God's grace without ever really uh, recognizing uh, repentance. There's, there's three, uh, 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 God's response here serves three uh, uh, purposes very quickly. First of all, I've already mentioned, it shows the insincerity of their request. Um, not only that, but God's statements in verses 11, 13 end up leading the people towards repentance. By, by initially rejecting them, God sort of wakes them up out of their stupor. You see that in verses 15 and 16. He makes that initial statement, that, but then what happens? He says in verse 14, go and cry out to the gods whom you've chosen. Let them save you in their time of distress. In other words, go and chase that. See if your foreign gods can, can, can deliver you. Then he says, and the people of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. You know what's happened? It woke them up. That, that, that initial response of God has got the people's intention. You, just say, you know what, God? You're right. We've sinned. We've done something wrong. Look what happens. Do to us whatever seems good to you. God, we're in your mercy. You are God and we are not. Do whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. Now they're getting sincere. What ends up happening here is, is God uh, shows his steadfast mercy. In the, in the very next verse, uh, you'll see that, so they put away the foreign gods from among them, repentance, and they serve the Lord, and he became, look what this says, impatient over the misery of Israel. I've got to focus on that word impatient for a moment. Um, the word there can be translated literally as impatient. But that really probably doesn't capture the idea of what, what, what's happening here. It's not like God standing back there getting impatient going, man, I wish these people would hurry up. But rather, it carries the idea, and I think the NIV, in one particular place where I think the NIV is a better translation uh, than the ESV, it's right here. 
the NIV has it this way. He could bear Israel's misery no longer. In other words, God was standing there, and as he sees the people responding in repentance, then what happens is God's love, his grace, his mercy, his kindness, well up inside of him, and and he can bear their misery no longer. So he begins to reach out to deliver them. Don't ever presume on God's grace without repentance. When we sin, come clean before God. Own that sin. Own what we've done. Come clean before God. And guess what? The Bible makes it clear. When we come clean before God, he always gives us grace. But if we presume on his grace without repentance, we'll get ourselves in trouble. Number two, we also, not only do we presume on God's grace without without repentance, but we also presume on God's blessing without seeking his guidance. I want you to notice what happens now in verse number 17. Then the Ammonites were called to arms, and they encamped in Gilead. And the people of Israel came together, and they camped at Mizpah. And the people, uh, the leaders of Gilead, said one another, Who is the man who will begin the fight against the Ammonites? He shall be head over all of the inhabitants of Gilead. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And his wife's sons grew up, and they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have any inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. And Jephthah fled from his borders and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader, that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Now let me stop here and just kind of back up uh, for just a moment and and show you a couple things. First of all, the Ammonites declare war on the nation of Israel and they set up a siege. They come to the area around Gilead, they set up a siege and, and, and everybody's in trouble. The leaders of Israel come together and they begin to look for a leader. What's interesting about this is never once in this passage do they pray. Never once in this passage do they seek God. In essence, they're almost calling for a volunteer. (laughs) Anybody want to lead us this time? Who wants to volunteer to be the general? Anybody want to sign up? Uh, May we go get this guy. What, What happens is they're really not seeking God's guidance. They're just kind of going through the motions. They're, they're, They're just saying, well... This is what we think we ought to do, and so they begin to go out. And so end up, they, the man who comes forward, they name Jephthah. He kind of get drafted into this. Now, Jephthah's an interesting character. He uh, is a man who is a mighty warrior but came from a dysfunctional family. His mother was a prostitute. And so all of Jephthah's life, he had to live with this stigma of being an illegitimate son. And by the way, his brothers reminded him of this all. You notice that in the past. They constantly remind him about all of this. And uh, um, his father, uh, Gilead, had a wife uh, who bore him other sons. And of course, this is going to become a constant reminder. Uh, Eventually, his brothers drive him away. They're like, we don't want you here. You're not... You're not a real heir to any of this. By the way, he was the oldest of Gilead's sons. So he's really the rightful heir of everything Gilead had. But no, you got to get out of here. You got to get away. They drive him out. And he collects up this band, the Bible says, of worthless fellows. I don't know exactly. These are rogues. These are guys out there, just kind of ne'er do wells, ruffians. He gathers them up and he forms this sort of army. Basically, he becomes the head of a street gang. This is the Gilead Crips, we'll call them, all right? Uh, they, they, they've got, they put together this little street gangs, but somewhere along the line, he's built this reputation that he is a really mighty warrior. Think about this guy. This is a guy who's had to fight all of his life. 
This is a guy who hangs around with people who have fought all his life. He is a tough, tough guy. He's Rambo of the Old Testament. He, he's going to come out, and, and immediately when people begin to look, say, what kind of guy do we find? They're not going to go get mild, meek guy. They already had that, by the way. Gideon was mild and meek. They are on after the rough, the tough, the macho man. This is the guy they're going to get. Wouldn't that be awesome if we ever did a play and the macho man, Randy Savage, would play Gilead? All right. And, uh, or Jephthah. All right. Uh, Jephthah, uh, he has all of the characteristics that people would think would be a great leader. He's aggressive. He's street smart. He's ambitious. He's driven. Got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. And so this reputation lead the people. Let's go get him and let's put him in control. Again, not a single mention of God in this, in this. They don't go pray about it. They don't go talk about it. They just simply presume that God would bless whatever plan they came up with. Now, this is an extreme example of that, but can we admit that sometimes we do that? We do that as churches sometimes. Let's get together and have a committee meeting. You ever notice there's no committee meetings in the Bible? Not a single one. They never get together with a group of people and say, you know, guys, what do you think we ought to do? They pray about it. God leads them. God guides them. But we have to be careful about something. Sometimes we presume that we know what direction we should go without first talking to God about it. And oftentimes, you know, in fact, most of the time, you know, the Bible says our thoughts are, you know, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And our ways are not his ways. We don't do the way things the way that God does them. So what we need to do is go back and we need to seek God's guidance and his leadership every time we presume to know which direction God would want us to go. We get ourselves in trouble. Go back and pray about it. We got a lot of our kids getting ready to go off to college here. So I'm going to stop here and say something. Don't presume that just because you're good at something, that that's what God wants you to do for the rest of your life. I got to hear an incredible testimony a few years ago uh, by a guy named David Allen. David Allen was an incredible baseball player when he was a young guy. He, he, he was uh, heavily scouted. He had college offers. He had pro offers uh, to go play baseball. Uh, tremendous, tremendous, tremendous athlete. And here's what he had, he had assumed, because God had given him this enormous talent to play ball, that, that what he would do is he would go off to college, he would pursue baseball, he'd play professional baseball, eventually retire, retire and then then he would go and serve God. But as he began to talk about it and pray about it, he got together with a, 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 his pastor, and, and they began to pray about it. And the pastor says, you know, David, I think that if you want to serve God, you just need to go serve him. It's all or nothing with God. You can't kind of walk both lines. You know, that's how we want to do sometimes. We want to have one eye a foot over here in the world, one foot over here with God. That's not how it works. You got to be all in. So David, you got to get all in. So David prayed about it and he was convinced that that's what God would have you to do. And he laid down and he never played baseball again. I like that. He didn't presume that just because God gave him a talent, that that's where God was going to use him. God took, think about it. If you were the Apostle Paul, if you were the Apostle Paul, you are a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Benjamite. You've been well-trained in, in the law. You're a Pharisee. You're one of the most educated men in all of Judaism. Wouldn't it make sense to you that God would call you to be the Apostle to the Jews? Wouldn't it make sense if you were Paul, go to Jerusalem, tell Peter, hey, Peter, get out of my seat. I'm going to be the head of the Jerusalem church now because I'm better qualified. If he would have presumed that, you and I wouldn't be here today. Because in reality, God called him to be the apostle to who? The Gentiles. They didn't make any earthly sense. If I was looking at it, I'd say, Paul, uh, he should go over here. Peter probably should... I don't know really what Peter should do. Maybe he'd be the apostle to fishermen. He should be the apostle to someone else. Actually, it would have made more sense for Peter 
to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He lived in a Gentile area. He probably knew more about Gentiles than, than, than Paul did at the beginning. And yet, God called him, don't presume without seeking God's guidance. Make sure that whatever you do in life, you get before God and say, God, is this what you'd have me to do? Pray about it. Talk to other Christians about it. Seek advice and guidance in the Word. Make sure you know the direction that God would have you call. Now, that brings me to one third, the third point. Not only do sometimes we presume on God's grace without repentance and presume uh, without, uh, on, God's, uh, on our direction without seeking God's guidance, but sometimes we presume to know what our immediate future holds. This next passage is probably the most difficult in all of the Bible, to be very honest. with Cliff and I have had a lot of discussions about this. And um, I'm going to be honest with you about something. I really don't think I completely understand this passage. Let's read it together and let me show you. This is the most difficult. In fact, it's the most troubling passage to me in all of the Old Testament. Maybe in the entire Bible. This is the most troubling passage. Look what he says. Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and and Manasseh, and he passed on to Mitzvah of Gilead, and from Mitzvah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give me the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out of my door, uh, the doors of my house, to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Gilead's got all excited, or uh, Jephthah's got all excited. He's like, I'm getting ready to go out for battle. I really need to make a deal with God here. So he says, God, listen, here's what you do. If you give me victory, if you let me whip a fire out of these Ammonites, if you let me win, when I get home, first thing comes out of my house when I get home, I'm offering it to you as a sacrifice. Y'all see that? Look what happens. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them. And the Lord gave them into his hands. And he struck them from Aror to the neighborhood of Mineth, 20 cities as far as abel uh, uh, Amon, and uh, uh, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. He wins. He crosses the river. He fights the battle. He whips the Ammonites. Everything else good. Verse 34. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mitzvah. I imagine by this time, Jephthah hadn't even been thinking about that vow. You ever do that with God? I remember when I was in high school, and I won't tell you what all kinds of vows I made, but I used to get mess up every once in a while. I would do something that I wasn't supposed to do. And I'd know, oh boy, I'm going to get caught. I'm going to get in trouble for this. Lord, if you, if you keep me from getting in trouble... I'll become a pastor. No, I never said that one. I'll do this for you, God. I'll do that. We make deals. You ever been there? Now, don't lie to me. Y'all have been there. We like to make deals with God. Jephthah made a deal with God. He probably hadn't even thought of it. In the euphoria of the battle, he'd won the victory. His his soldiers are probably cheering him on. Jephthah's got the greatest general in the history of the nation of Israel. Jephthah, you're awesome. Jephthah, you're going to be king. Jephthah, you're going to be, you know, your name's going to go down in all of history for this victory. And it's going to go down in all of history. But we're going to forget the victory. Because when he arrives home, look what happens. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had no son nor daughter. God, I'll offer as a burnt offering the first thing that comes out of my house if you just give me this victory. And he gets home. And it's his daughter. His only daughter. He has no other sons, no other daughters, just her. And she comes running out. Now, Jephthah knows something. In the Old Testament, you have to keep your vow. Ain't no getting around this. God said you make a vow, keep the vow. Look what happens. 
And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes. He said, Alas, my daughter, you brought me very low. You've become a cause of great trouble to me, for I've opened my mouth to the Lord. I kind of what he think he's saying there is, I popped off. I said something I shouldn't have said. I opened my mouth without thinking. And look what he says. And I cannot take it back, my vow. And she said to him, my father, you've opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone. Now, she, if she'd have known what he said, she probably wouldn't have said that. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has avenged you on the enemies of the Amorites. So she said to the father, let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months that I may go up and down to the mountains and weep for my virginity and am my companion. So she, he said, go. And then she went, sent her away for two months, and she departed. And she and her companions and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of the two months, she returned to her father, who did what, with her according to his vow that he had made. We need to stop here. Oh, let me, let me just finish reading that. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to the lament, the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileite, four days in the year. Now, we have to stop here, and we have to address the giant elephant in the room. Does this passage teach that Jephthah killed his daughter when she came back? I'm going to honestly tell you, I do not know. It never says that he did. She is obviously willing to allow herself to be sacrificed. But that would seem to go against the character of God. Uh, honestly, human life is more valuable to God than a rash vow. There's also something else strange. He sends her out there to weep for her virginity. That's a weird statement. That's an odd statement. I don't think you're going to find There's no other place in the Bible where we can go and find an example and find out what does that mean. A, a lot of scholars think what happens here is she goes off into the wilderness, and what happens is rather than sacrificing her physically as a burnt offering, Jephthah offers her as a living sacrifice, that, that she is going to be forever unmarried and unable to have children. Now think about what that does to Jephthah's family. That ends his family right there. No grandsons, no great-grandsons, you're done. Family line is over. And lots of people think, and, and I tend to think that is a very good way of probably understanding. That explains why she sends him out into the wilderness for this period of time and she weeps. And, and, and then there is no record of, of the fact that he actually takes her life. Now we can sit there and debate all day about whether he does or he doesn't. I don't really think that's the point. The point here is this. This teaches us three key lessons. There is a danger anytime we presume we know what the future holds. Jephthah thought he knew, God, if you'll just give me this victory, when I get home, first thing that's going to come out of my house is going to be a goat, a sheep. I don't know what came out of Israelite houses. Fill in whatever you want to. All right? Whatever he probably in his life never really thought it would be his daughter. Come on. Can we submit this? We don't really know what the future holds. So, so don't presume on the future. You don't know what this life holds. Life could throw you a curveball today. You could get a bad diagnosis from the doctor. You could have an accident. Something could happen in your life today that could change you for the rest of your earthly life. Don't presume you know what the future holds. Number two, we need to grow in our relationship with God. Jephthah's problem here is too low of a view of God. That's what this passage ultimately teaches us. Jephthah thinks God exists to serve Jephthah. He thinks God just said, God, let's make a deal. You do this, I'll do this, you do this. He, he thinks that, that God can be manipulated with foolish, stupid vows. Let me tell you, let me how arrogant that is. That's assuming that he knows better than God how to conduct the affairs of the universe. The Bible makes it clear. We serve an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-wise God. 
We serve a God who sits on the throne of eternity, and he can see the beginning and the end and every moment in between. He knows what's going to happen to you today. He knows what's going to happen to you next week. He knows everything about it. He knows not only what you're going to do, but what you're thinking about doing. He knows why you do what you do. He knows everything. And yet Jephthah assumes... I know better than God, so I need to manipulate him. Isn't that arrogant? Think about us. Sometimes when we pray, we just uh, we exude arrogance. God, please do this for me, whatever you have to do to this for And we assume we know. Sometimes, we, wouldn't it be better if we said, God, this is what I desire you to do. But then maybe we just say need to add the words of Jesus, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. God, I don't know where you're taking me. I don't know what you got to plan for me. So God, I'm just here and I'm saying, Lord, this is what I see and this is what I desire. But God, if those are the wrong things, change the desires of my heart. Jephthah never does that. He just presumes he knows what God wants. Third, we don't know what the immediate future holds. Life can change quickly. We've already said that. Tragedy strikes, economic downturns. Things can change in a heartbeat. That's always amazing to me. I, I was watching here a, 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 a series on uh, the, the uh, uh, TV here the other day, and it was about uh, football team. I was telling Coach Glass about it. Uh, it was about the, uh, the Arizona Cardinals, and, and, and they had two seasons. One was about the Cardinals. One was about the uh, Rams when they moved to L.A., and, and it's always amazing to me. One week, these guys would be up. We're going to win the Super Bowl. Then one bad thing would happen, and they'd be clear down here. <laughs> Life does that to us, does it not? One day, you're walking on top of the world. The next day, you're at the bottom. We don't know. Therefore, we have to trust God. Our immediate future, listen, our immediate future is unsure. But we can lock down eternity. You hear me? Your immediate future is unsure. Don't know what's going to happen. There's lots of uncertainty in this life. If there's one thing we can be certain of is that in this life we can be uncertain. And yet... The Bible assures us that we can lock down eternity. Now, let me tell you why that's important. This world, this life that you live in right now, this is just the beginning. This isn't the end. This isn't all that God created for you. He made you for something greater. He made you for eternity. The book, the book of Psalms says God has written eternity on our hearts. God's greatest goal in your life is not just to get you through college, not just to get you a good career, not just so that you'll have children and, and a family and, and all the things that happen in this life. God's goal is to conform you into the very image of his son one of these days in eternity. But see, that begins right now. I remember when I was a kid, our pastor would talk about eternal life, receiving eternal life. And for a long time, I always thought, well, eternal life is something, di you know, you got to die before you get eternal life, right? But I learned something. Eternal life is not so much about the quantity as it is the quality. Yes, it is about quantity. Your eternal life begins the moment that you come to know Jesus. And it guarantees that you are going to live in God's presence for all eternity. But it's also about a quality. That's why Jesus describes, he says, I've come to give you life and that more abundant. See, we think all of the things in this world give us an abundant life. If I had a lot of money and I had a lot of cars and I had a lot of wealth and I had a lot of power and, and, and got to have lots of fun and pleasure in life, that would be satisfying. But you know what? Read the book of Ecclesiastes. None of those things will satisfy you. Money doesn't satisfy you. Sex doesn't satisfy you. Pleasure doesn't satisfy you. Power doesn't satisfy you. Don't believe me? Read Ecclesiastes. There's the story of a guy who had all of those things, and he said they were all vanity. They were all just disappeared when you buy it into them. That's why God came to give us abundant life. He's come to give us something far more satisfying. He's come to lock 
down eternity. You can be sure of eternity. That's, that's what's so wonderful. I'm going to preach a funeral for my good buddy Jack. Jack had his diagnosis here a few weeks ago, you know. We knew something was going on with Jack. He didn't seem real right. He wasn't doing well. Went to go to the doctor. Nobody had any idea it was going to be as devastating as it was. Massive spread of cancer. They said you might have six months to live. That's a earth-shattering news. Can we agree with that? When you walk into a doctor and you're saying, I'm just not feeling very well, and you walk out and you say, you got six months, and you find out really in reality it turned out to be about four weeks. I remember sitting with Jack, and I said, Jack, I'm so sorry. I loved what he said. I know where I'm going. I have no doubt. Say a few years ago, just before I got here, actually, just before Greg Dills left, I think it was on the last week that Greg was here, if I remember the story correct, Jack came and gave his life to Christ and was saved. And he could face death. Oh, I'm not saying that he wasn't sad about it. I'm not saying that there weren't moments that he thought, man, I'm going to leave my family behind. I'm going to do this, you know, and, and it's going to be difficult. But he knew, I've got eternity wrapped up. His immediate future Unsure. It might be painful. It might be difficult. I don't know what's going to happen in the immediate. But his eternity was locked down. Amen? You can have eternity locked down. That's what this... Get your mind off the immediate. If Jephthah would have just been thinking about, what does God want me to do? If he had had an eternal perspective, he would have just had a little bit of humility in his mind, not to try to manipulate God, but just simply seek God's guide. Boy, wouldn't have life gone so much smoother? We wouldn't be sitting here this morning going, I wonder what he did to his daughter. I wonder what happened to her. I don't know. When we get to heaven, we can ask God. Can I tell you a little secret? Probably won't matter when we get to heaven anyways. God put that there to remind us. Don't presume. Have a bigger picture. Today, I want to ask you a question. Are you ready for eternity? You better be. Every single one of us, we're just one heartbeat. One heartbeat. Tragedy could strike. A moment could happen. We could pass into eternity. You could be in eternity today. That's how fast life is. Short life is. Just so quick. The Bible describes it as a vapor. Are you ready? Do you have eternity locked down?